Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 8th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why While many say rail belt energy will be a big issue this session, our hope is that the legislature leaves the issue to market forces and doesn't interfere. Second, we explain what we think the recent Alaska jobs report is telling us about the economy. And third, we discuss why we think the Kenai Peninsula Borough Assembly has become part of the problem we face in this state not part of the solution. And now let's join Michael. We got uh, got a lot of stuff to go over this morning and we're gonna start off with uh, the rail belt, utilities, market forces, things that are coming up in the session. Um, and um, I guess we should start talking about that because there's a lot of discussion about energy uh, and it's gonna it's gonna be a bigger player in this session than I expected. Uh, with everybody talking about rail belt utilities and drilling in the Cook Inlet and so on and so forth, so let's start off there with number one. Well, it is Michael, and I and I, I share some of your surprise, uh, but I also have and I also have disappointment uh, about it. Um, so uh, Jeff Landfield had a discussion with. Uh, uh, Bill Wilikowski and, and one of the reps uh, last week about the top three issues and that are going to be uh, up this legislative session. And one of them uh, was energy in the rail belt was uh, was the cook inlet gas situation and and how we how we as a state uh, deal with that. And and both were both the uh, both Senator Wilikowski and the rep were were uh, uh, fairly uh, vocal in saying, oh, the legislature needs to be involved and we need to you know, here, here are some, some of the things we need to do. Well, we don't, (laughs) we, we don't need to be involved. We've got companies, private companies, NSTAR, stockholder owned companies, um, NSTAR on the gas side. And well, I guess it's not stockholder owned, but it's, it's, it's a co-op owned private company, uh, Chugach on the electric side that are mandated, uh, required, uh, have accepted certificates that obligate them to, maintain safe and reliable uh, 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 utility service uh, to, uh, to, to their customers in South Central. We've got a government agency, the Alaska Public Utilities Commission, that oversees uh, that process and is required to ensure that those utilities live up to their obligation to ensure safe, reliable, and, and to the extent they can, economic service uh, to, uh, to their customers in, uh, in South Central. Uh, that's, you know, that's quite a bit of obligation sitting there. Companies have the obligation to, you know, to look out for their supply. They have an obligation to look out for, uh, for their customers. They have an obligation to have reasonable, uh, rates. Um, and, and, you know, we've, we've charged those private companies with that obligation by accepting their certificates, their utility certificates, they have those obligations. Now the, uh, legislature thinks it needs to get in the middle of all that, (laughs) Uh, because there's a crisis and, you know, only the legislature, only only the Alaska legislature can solve these things. It's not just the legislature. I mean, we've had the the governor announce new programs uh, uh, to deal right. with it, to deal with it as well. So, you know, it, it seems to be something that uh, that that 
because it's in the headlines, the legislature, the Alaska legislature thinks uh, they need to deal with it. And we're getting well, and interestingly enough, we're getting two Republicans who are pushing on this. You got George Rauscher, who pre-filed that legislation to eliminate royalties. And then Jesse Sumner, who, who has come forward with a bill that would basically lock permanent fund earnings aside to pay for 25 percent ownership in a gas pipeline, cap the dividend at a thousand bucks in perpetuity until it's paid for, apparently. Uh, so it's not like it's just uh, it's not like it's one side of the aisle or the other who's coming up with these ideas. Well, I, I would say that that Jesse and 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 George's proposals rank second and third in in terms of the silliest uh, that I've seen. Walter Featherly, who is running for, uh, 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 has run before, been defeated, but is running again uh, for a state legislative seat, had an op-ed uh, in December uh, that was titled "The Cook: The Solution to Cook Inlet Gas Supply Is Under Our Noses." Well, actually, it was up. It was published on December 27th, for those who want to go back and find it. The solution to cook inlet gas supply is under our noses. And he advocated, get this, he advocated that ADA go in and buy uh, the uh, the interests of, uh, of, of uh, Blue Crest that owns uh, the Cosmopolitan field, one of the fields that have been touted as having, you know, su su sufficient gas supply to get us out of this mess, to buy... Uh, out the cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan gas field and to buy out uh, John Hendricks' uh, 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 gas field uh, a little north of Cosmopolitan and operate them, Ada, to buy and operate uh, those fields. And that would ensure that uh, that we uh, deal with uh, that we deal with the gas supply. So, you know, state ownership, the means of production <laughs> is you know, take, take it out of the hands of the private sector that, that you know, has 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 free market uh, uh, aspects around it, take it out of their hands and, and, and impose the state in there with a mandate to go in and sort of notwithstanding cost mandate to go in there uh, and, uh, and produce those fields, sort of state takeover of the fields, if you will. So that's, that wins the prize in my mind for the most, the most bizarre outlandish proposal to do away with the, with the, with free enterprise system in the private market in this situation. Sumner's number two. Uh, the the proposal to have uh, use the permanent fund earnings to, or the permanent fund to come in and buy uh, a portion of uh, 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 a fund a portion of the of the big line or of the of the of the of a line down from the slope uh, to uh, to provide gas supply to South Central is uh, is number two the economics of that I've I've been involved in that line for I was involved deeply in that line back in the yeah, early right. 2018 I followed that line all the way along. Um, and the economics of that line are just are just horrible. So it's basically come in, use the permanent fund, subsidize a line that's otherwise ec uneconomic and charge it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families um, uh, by by funding it through uh, uh, funding it through funding the below market investment that, that he's having the permanent fund make uh, on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families through uh, through PFD cuts. That's the second one. Rauscher, Rauscher just comes in third. I mean, the the proposal to do away with royalties and the proposal, you know, we don't have production taxes in the Cook Inlet anymore. We've already given those up. Um, and the proposal to do away with royalties uh, for sales to uh, utilities in South Central, uh, that that only comes in third among the among the bizarre uh, legislative proposals out there. So it's the legislature. But here's the point: the legislature should stay the heck away. From this issue, we have private companies charged with the obligation of making sure that their service. We already have government overlay in the form of the Alaska Public Utilities Commission overseeing those utilities in the in in their in their in, in their obligations. If they if they fall short, the APUC has a power to has the power to redirect them and 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 direct that they take actions uh, in a in another uh, in another direction. We don't need the legislature coming in on top of all of that, especially Republicans. We don't need the legislature coming in on, on top of all of that and say, oh, heck, to heck with market forces. We, the state, know, know better than anybody else how to handle these things. So it's that'll, that'll just make this situation worse. Um, well, let me let me devil's advocate here for a minute. I mean, we here in Alaska are different than any place else because we have this collectively owned resource that's owned by the state. Uh, collectively as a people. What about the argument that 
that's the only thing we're going to get it done. Whether we do, you know, if it was a privately held thing, maybe the owners would develop it. So what's the, you know, what's the, what's the, what's the counter to that argument there? It is, the, it is privately owned. I mean, we've got, we've, we've leased out uh, the cosmopolitan field to Bluecrest. We've leased out the, the, uh, the fields that uh, John Hendricks uh, operates to John Hendricks. We've leased out the North slope to producers on the North slope. If, if they thought they were going to be able to make money out of, out of monetizing their, uh, uh, if they and their investors thought they were going to be able to make money out of monetizing those resources, they would do it. The fact they aren't, the fact they can't attract investors to monetizing those resources says the economics aren't there for monetizing those resources. So why should right. the state who, who, who is not operating these fields, doesn't have a feel for the, for the economics of the field, why should the state step in and say, oh, wait, well, we know better. You know, we're going to throw our money at it. Right. it it's it's going to end up costing the state more uh, in the, and, and consumers more in the end consumers writ large because you know if you use pfd cuts to fund it you're 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 forcing everybody in the state all the middle and lower income alaska families in the state southeast south central uh the interior bush you know all over the place uh to help to help fund uh, uh south central uh, electric or utility customers so we, we already have private sector involvement in this in this decision making process and they're saying the economics don't work and that brings you to the opinion piece from Charles Wolfworth, which basically says we need to stop, we need to stop drinking the copium and just uh, and basically, you know, admit that we're going to have to import gas essentially instead. You know, step, put up the put away the pipe dream of being a major exporter, uh, and instead just focus on renewables and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think well. Wolferth, Wolferth may, may go a tad too far in the other direction saying, well, we just need to accept LNG. What I'm saying, what I'm arguing is we need to, we need to let the private sector work. We need to let NSTAR and Chugach figure out what makes the most economic sense. We need to let the Alaska Public Utilities Commission, which is charged with overseeing these decisions, to, to, do, its, to do its work and to decide whether the decisions the recommendations being made by NSTAR and Chugach are in the public interest. We need to let that system work. We don't need to intervene in it. I, we don't need to automatically say, well, LNG is the answer. LNG may be the answer. And I think Wolfer's opinion piece is useful in, in sort of un helping us understand why LNG may be the answer. LNG may be the answer, but we need to we need to let the system, the private economic system that we've set up in this state uh, work and let them determine what the most economic uh, alternative is. I know, I know we got a lot of gas in the state. I know we got, we think we still have a lot of gas in Cook Inlet. I think, I know we, we have a lot of gas on the North Slope. I know we want to use that gas to meet this need, but economics need to rule. We don't need to impose ex excess burdens, excess economic burdens on the state uh, uh, in solving this problem. We need to let market forces rule. Yeah, because the state has got such a great track record with trying to develop projects on their own. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, those kind of solutions. Anytime I see those kind of solutions, while I feel the frustration of many people watching this, I also understand that uh, if you want a cost plus project, just have the state jump in there and figure it out. And uh, and and you'll see exactly how well that that ends up being run out there for sure. Again, I, I feel the frustration of Weatherly and others who have said, you know, this, that it, it is frustrating. We've got trillions of cubic feet of gas up on the North Slope. We've got, you know, there's billions of cubic feet of gas in the Cook Inlet. We've just got to find it and, you know, find the stable fields, et cetera, et cetera. But you can't just be like, OK, fine, we'll just spend all the people's money to make it work. And again, because the government has got such a great track record of uh, managing and creating projects and doing so well. I just you know, if you want to create the next boondoggle, that's kind of what you, I understand the frustration. But I also understand that market forces have got to prevail. Otherwise, it's just, you know, it's billions. Of, I think Wolfer said something about setting a billion dollars on fire and just watching it burn. That's kind of what you would have to do at this point. You know, I uh, I had a little exchange on Twitter last night with Jesse about his uh, about his bill. And the, and the pushback was, well, we're going to have higher energy costs where, you know, if we have LNG, we're going to have higher energy costs in the Cook Inlet. Look, folks, 
we're going to have higher energy costs no matter what happens. I mean, uh, Alaska has been fortunate uh, to live for decades off of the Cook Inlet, off Cook Inlet gas supply uh, that has allowed us to have a fairly low cost view globally, a fairly low cost gas supply uh, relative uh, relative to others. And and yes, prices are going to go up. It's a question of how much they're going to go up, and it's a question of who bears the costs. Um, what what these what what Weatherly's or Featherly's proposal and Jesse's proposal and other proposals are are essentially to subsidize South Central energy costs by using state funds to to you know to earn below market returns um, in various investments to try to keep these energy costs down. But it's just a subsidy. It's a state subsidy, and it's going to come out of somebody's pocket. Jesse's proposal explicitly is to take it out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. Weatherly sort of works it a little bit slower. He does it through ADA, but ADA gets funded by the legislature. And, and where's the legislature going to find those additional funds? They're going to find those additional funds uh, out of PFD cuts if we keep going the way, way we're going. So it's, uh, it's, they're, they're trying to say, look, we're going to, we're, we know how to keep energy costs in, in South Central down, but they're doing it by just pouring in excess money, uh, excess state money to subsidize those costs down. And somebody's bearing the burden uh, of those, of those excess state right. costs that are being, that are being poured in. Well, we've got, we've got a private sector that's doing it. We ought to just let them do their, do their right. jobs. Well, and, and the thing is, everybody would be subsidizing it, those, you know, from a PFD, but those that would feel it the most are the lower and middle income families because they feel that PFD cut the most uh, more than anything else. And to have everybody in the state pay for the uh, the comfort and the and the subsidy for just the rail belt area, although, I mean, most people live on the rail belt. So, I mean, I could see some of the justification that, but again, you've got everyone in the state paying for that. And that just makes no sense whatsoever you know what that starts michael all right so so south Cent or south central the rail belt gets you know subsidized energy costs and then the bush says well where's ours and southeast says well where's ours and then we got to create these new programs out there i mean that's how power cost equalization got started back in the day we got to create these new programs out there so that they get some of it they get some money also and by the by the time you're you're done with it not only are you are you throwing in excess funds to subsidize South Central? You're throwing in excess funds to to have offset yeah. subsidies out in the bush and and in South uh, Southeast. You keep using that word excess, and I don't think it means what you think it means. I don't think there's an excess of money. I think it's uh, taking that money from someplace. I mean, it's essentially taking it from the PFT, right? I mean, that's at this point, that's the easiest grab of money out there. Yeah, excess above what the market would tell you is economic. That's that's what yeah. I mean by excess yeah. in, in this context. Yeah. No, it's uh, definitely a frustration to be had uh, for sure. Uh, and again, I could see the justification in some people's mind, but it still makes no sense because you have to ask the question, who pays? And uh, if you're not asking that question, I don't think you're doing the full, I don't think you're doing the full job. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a frustrating thing. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, continues with us here this morning uh, on the Michael Duke Show. Number two, the jobs report is coming in, um, and they're saying, "Oh, it's all, it's all, it's all going to be. We're almost back to pre-pandemic, almost back to pre-pandemic level." Um, although I don't think that says the the big picture. I mean, anecdotally, as I've been talking about more and more as I go around and look at different businesses, I mean, everybody's trying to hire. I don't know what the problem is exactly, but uh, it's it's we've got some issues here, and I don't know if this jobs report is giving us the full picture. Brad, what do you see when you look at this? Well, I think the ADN headline, uh, uh, well, actually the Alaska Beacon uh, headline, captured uh, what's going on with the jobs report. The Department of Labor it calculates uh, on the backs of what the feds do. The Department of Labor calculates uh, uh, the outlook uh, uh, for Alaska jobs. Just they just issued their report. Uh, and said uh, and and projects that that jobs are up, but here's here's the headline uh, on the on the article: Alaska job growth driven by big projects expected to put employment at pre-COVID levels. And the when you read on down through the article, as if you read on down through the Department of Labor report, the major catalyst for job growth, the forecast said, will be big projects, federally funded infrastructure projects 
in mining and oil and gas development, which is primarily the Willow um, and the Pika projects uh, up on the North Slope. That's what's driving uh, 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 job growth. And as, as you and Ben discussed yesterday, you know, the federal funds are here today, but they're going to be gone tomorrow. You can't count on them, you know, being providing a consistent uh, uh, basis for uh, uh, for the Alaska economy. And so and when you look at at our history with with the North Slope, what happens is when we're in development with these fields, when we're in development with with big fields like Prudhoe in the past, Kaparik in the past, Point Thompson in the early uh, 20-teens, uh, job numbers go way up because you're in the construction phase. You've got a lot of construction going on, not only up on the slope, but also down in Anchorage and supported that, or in, and in Fairbanks and supported that. Uh, but once those projects uh, are finished, uh, once Point Thompson was finished in the early 20 teens, once Prudhoe was finished back in the day, and once Willow's finished and once Pika's finished, those jobs, those oil and gas jobs uh, uh, come back down. The maintenance jobs uh, are, are much less than the construction phase uh, jobs. So what we're, what, what we're seeing in the jobs report is, is a bump, but the bumps being caused by uh, big projects, uh, the federally funded infrastructure projects as the, as the dollars from uh, the, the infrastructure and the, and the you know, uh, uh, inflation, keep inflation down, uh, uh, acts uh, start to hit the state. Um, and as, uh, as those big oil projects hit, it's tell it's, it, when you look, when you look through the numbers and you look at small business, uh, air activities in which small business enga is engaged, for example, you don't see the job numbers bouncing back up. You see them sort of, you know, staying at a fairly, at a, at a fairly level field. So the, the Alaska boom economy, the, the boom economy driven by big projects, federally funded projects oil and gas projects is, 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 is reawakening is, is bringing those, bringing those jobs, uh, re jobs related to those projects back, but the fundamental economics, the fundamental, uh, 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 businesses in Alaska, the small businesses, the, the businesses that aren't engaged in, uh, in those industries or supporting those industries, uh, aren't seeing the same sort of job growth. We're seeing the same sort of depression, uh, in those jobs that we, uh, that we've seen before. Well, and this again goes back and points out uh, the glaring impact of having a public and a private economy that are divorced from each other, right? I mean, the 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 jobs that they're touting in these jobs reports are all jobs that are in some way or another funded by governmental dollars. Uh, the private sector still out there struggling, uh, and and it kind of the overall arching. Um, what I read between the lines on this piece was basically saying, "Oh, look." Uh, the government economy is doing well, so we must be doing better uh, instead of what is the private economy doing. And that that's the thing. They're always focused. And, the, and here's the thing. The federal dollars. Uh, I mean, I pointed this out several times here in just the last couple of weeks. But, you know, we last year we spent nearly a trillion dollars on debt service in this country. This year, it's going to be over $1.1 trillion in debt service. And that's assuming the current rate of growth, which is unsustainable in and of itself. We're not going to be seeing those federal dollars, you know, for 10, for, you know, 10 years from now, it'll be a whole different picture. And if we don't see those monies and we don't have a, a, a private economy that helps support it, we're going to be in serious trouble. Yeah, we've got, we've got, a we've got both the federal government and a legislature that's picking winners and losers, right? I mean, they're they're taking dollars, particularly in the area of the PFD, they're taking dollars that otherwise would help fund mom and pop, help fund uh, uh, small startup businesses. If you look back to the Kenya study, uh, help, help build that small business sector uh, in the economy. They're taking those dollars and refunneling them out to their, to the legislators, legislators selected industries that they want to help, that they think, you know, are deserving of their help, child care, um, uh, the K through 12 industry, that sort of that sort of thing. We're not we've got money in this state uh, uh, that that helps that that is supposed to go help uh, uh, small businesses, go help small business growth in terms of putting it in the hands of people who can make the uh, uh, residents who can make the decision about where they want to invest their money. And many do invest it in small businesses. Uh, uh, we've got a, a program that does that, but 
you know, we legislature doesn't want to do that. They, they just want, they want big pops. Uh, they want to invest the money where, you know, their constituents, excuse me, where their donors uh, are, are trying to direct, uh, direct the money to. So it's, um, I, we, we've got a, we've got a, a, a screwed up economy that's built on big things funded by, by big, you know, pushes from either uh, uh, the, the oil and gas industry, which, you know, we've, We've jerry-rigged our oil and gas tax system to incentivize, essentially, give public funds to uh, to the development of those projects, uh, and then the federal money coming in, the big federal money coming in for infrastructure. We've built, we 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 are continuing to build our economy dependent on these big, as you say, government subsidized or government funded projects, um, and uh, and leaving the mom and pop, the small businesses. That's the heart of the uh you know what you find in the lower 48 uh leaving them uh, sort of high and dry by taxing them ta taking money out of out of middle and lower income alaska families to allow the legislature to redirect it off to you know the 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 places that uh, their donors tell them to tell them to put it so what is the what are the job report what does it tell you ultimately uh on this and you know where do we go from here tells you tells me that alaska is still in this boom and bust cycle that we're not we're not engaged in developing industries or businesses that sort of that are sort of you know outside of the boom and bust cycle that just sort of continue on regardless of where the where the boom and bust cycle is that we are that we are committing ourselves to stay in this boom and bust cycle by living on big expenditures that come from big projects and we and we and and we're you know, sort of like a junkie. Uh, we're just sort of sitting there dependent. We build an economy that's dependent on these big projects. And, and when the big projects go away, we're, we're sort of like a junkie sitting there, you know, just ship or just, you know, shaking because we need another fix of the big projects, some outside money or some state money uh, to come in and, and generate some additional projects. We are not building, Rob Myers makes this point better than anybody. We're not building a fundamental basic economy in the state uh through our through our programs we're we're just dependent on these on these big projects as the as they come in and go away well and that's again something that we've been talking about i mean yesterday uh uh, Bra uh excuse me uh, uh, ben. uh ben carpenter made the point you know look at look at our expenditures overall expenditures uh, you know, uh, from a six billion dollars to a fourteen billion dollar spend increase over the course of the years, and a big chunk of that is federal dollars. And eventually, as we've seen in the past, what will happen is those dollars will go away, whether it's in the short term or the long term. Those dollars are going to go away, and if we have no underpinnings of a private economy, that's when things are really going to get tough. You talk about boom, and that will be the full bust cycle. Yeah, that that'll be back to that'll be back to you know pre oil era, uh, Alaska. It, it, you know, it's just I mean th this sort of relates to 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 the first segment right about the Cook Inlet. I mean Jesse Sumner's proposal of of taking a of funding a quarter of a of a gas pipeline down from the North Slope uh, uh, through uh, through the permanent fund. It's we we've 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 made ourselves dependent on on these big projects, and you know when we don't have one. We've got contractors out there who get all nervous about, you know, not having enough work. Notwithstanding that we've got Willow going on and Pika going on now, we've got contractor, contractors out there worried about the next project. And so, you know, the answer is, oh, we got we got this crisis in Cook Inlet. Well, look, we can do a two for one. We can solve this crisis in Cook Inlet. And we could have this big boom, this big construction boom to build this pipeline and keep all these contractors happy uh, all at the same time. Well, that's not how... It's not how a fundamental economy works. A fundamental economy works with small businesses growing, um, and small businesses, you know, need need support uh, in in that effort. Not not government support in the sense of, hey, you, this small business over here, you guys win. I'm going to give you a grant. Hey, right. you, small business over here, I'm going to give you a grant. Picking winners and losers again. Exactly. Right. Yeah, they exactly. need they need support in terms of low taxes and somebody right. will now say well alaska has no taxes we do have taxes that's what permanent fund cuts are and we're taking it out of the heart of the of the economy we're taking it out of middle income alaska families <laughs> the heart 
of what builds uh, a stable small business economy. And when you say fundamental economy, what you're talking about is a basic underpinnings of a private economy, uh, keeping everything afloat outside of the boom and bust cycle of government spending. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, it, again, it's frustrating for us who have been watching this for a long time and are, are trying to, you know, lay this out there and nobody else seems to see it. We get, we, we seem to be addicted to that boom and bust cycle. And you're right. We've created a dependency economy at multiple levels. I mean, we've talked about the dependency state in Alaska on the social safety net and the welfare side. Uh, and we in the program here have been talking about the other side, the corporate cronyism and the safety net of, of, uh, of government spend for these big companies that have basically built their whole business model around government spending. We are really the, the poster child for a dependency state on both ends of the spectrum at this point. We are. Yeah. And in this jobs report, I guess, I guess the, the, the ultimate point here is this jobs report just says it's sort of the feedback loop, right? I mean, everybody goes around saying, Oh, good jobs report. we got a lot of jobs. Well, look at where those jobs are. Look at what's going on. Look at what we're depending on right. to, to, ha to have a good jobs report. It's and what's not the longevity? And what's the longevity of those jobs? Is this a short-term fix or is this a long-term solution? And the problem is it's that short-term high and then you're, you're right back down again into the doldrums again. And that's the problem. Right. And we, and we, and we sit there dependent, sit there waiting on the next fix, waiting on the next, the next uh, 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 ingestion or the next, you know, funds that, that come in. And it's just, I, I, it's, it's a good jobs report in the sense that yes, we got jobs and it's a good jobs report in the sense that yes, you know, the economy is going to, is going to kick back up. We've got, we've got jobs out there. We're not, we're no longer in the doldrums, certainly of the pandemic and we're, and we're coming out of that. And yes, we've got good projects. That's, that's, that's great news, but that's sort of all we got. <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's the bad news. I mean, the, right. The right. bad news is all we got are these big project uh, uh, jobs. We don't have the fundamental basic economy, you know, slowly building up through through the development of small businesses. We've just got we've just got these boom jobs. This new phrase, the fundamental uh, fundamental economy. I think it's good because it points out what we've been saying for a while. Again, it highlights the fact that the public and the private economies are divorced now. In in general, in most states, the overall economy is a component of those two things, but they work in synchronicity, right? I mean, they're they're slaved to each other uh, because the government economy can out, out, cannot outrun the private economy because it's dependent on the private economy for its revenue. We're here in the state of Alaska. We're outside that paradigm. And so we can do kind of whatever. So we do have two economies, one being the government economy with this boom and bust cycle and one being the private economy that's just trying to stay afloat and keep up. So it's kind of important to point that out. I mean, that's kind of a continuation of what we've been talking about with Rob Myers. Yeah, what you want, what you want is is a jobs report or any sort of economic report that so, that shows your baseline level uh, continuing to grow over time. I mean, not it doesn't it doesn't just you know spike up, but you want it continuing to grow uh, over time. What we've got in Alaska is that baseline level sort of stays down here, goes down during the pandemic, maybe comes back up to where it was before the pandemic. But our jobs growth comes with these big, you know, the the federal infrastructure dollars, and then the, and then the, you know, the the the, the oil and gas projects, you know, in part funded by oil and gas uh, uh, tax tax breaks. That's where our jobs come from, and and our baseline isn't unlike in the lower forty eight or in or in you know solid economies like you know, Texas or elsewhere, Florida elsewhere. It's not it's not it's not coming up. Slowly, it's just sort of staying there, and then we get these humps coming out of uh, coming out of these these big projects. What we should want is, I mean, I'm not saying let's not have these let's not have these bumps when they come, but what we should want is this baseline, like in other states, successful states, gradually creeping up. Um, and and how does that happen in some in some of those other states? Well, in Oklahoma and Texas, it's handled it, it, it's in part through royalties that come from oil and gas that go into the private sector and have helped fund, provide capital to fund some of these small businesses that have, that have, that have grown and, and grow the, grow the underlying, underlying base in Florida's tourism. 
uh, that that's helped you know fund private private funds coming from tourism that's helped uh, uh, build those up. In Alaska, you know our oil and gas royalties. We, we are we are most like of all those states. We're most like Texas and Oklahoma. And in Alaska, our royalties go to the state. But Governor Hammond created a mechanism, a workaround mechanism that that would would put a portion of it, fifty percent of the earnings from the permit fund, put a portion of, of it in the private sector. Well, we'll what we've got now is the state taking that away and and diverting it over to these boom and bust programs, so essentially funding these boom and bust programs. So our underlying fundamental economy isn't growing at all. Every time we get one of these jobs reports or we get one of these economic reports, my eye goes immediately to what's going on outside of the boom and bust. Is, is the fundamental, is the baseline growing? And it's not in Alaska. And that's that's a problem. That's a problem because we don't, when these busts go, when these boom and bust, when these booms go away and they turn into busts, we just come crashing all the way back down to this to this low level that uh, that we got going on in the private sector instead of instead of having that private sector grow and coming back down sort of a soft landing into that into that growing private sector. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, I mean, ideally, we'd love to see a jobs report that was equitable across all the sectors across all the, I mean, that's what you want to see, right? Instead of the touting of, look at how all this government money, I, I, I'm paraphrasing here, but that essentially the article said, look at how all these big government dollars are making the economy flow again, which again, plays right back into the narrative. I mean, Ben mentioned it yesterday. There are plenty of people down in Juneau who believe that as long as the public sector economy, the government economy is doing well, we're doing well. And that's not necessarily the case. And that's, again, where that divorce happens between the two. Well, the, 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 the favored industries or the favored companies, the, the, the companies selected by the you know, 20 plus 11 plus one in the appropriations bills, they're doing well. But everybody else, but the fundamental economy, the non-government funded economy, uh, it isn't. I mean, you just you look at the jobs report, you look at the economics report. They aren't. They're just they're just sort of, you know, scratching along at at at, at a at a bare minimum. So, uh, w- w- <laughs> y- 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 w- the the Juno perspective is yes, the ones we fund are doing well. Well, okay, good. But you aren't funding everybody. You're funding a select few that you and your donors have 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 pre selected to be successful. So yeah, if you look at it that way you're successful, but the rest of the economy, what you want to be growing isn't. And it's because you're you're taxing it in in, for one reason, because you're taxing it. Right. Welcome back to the program. The Michael Duke show continues. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. The weekly top three finishes here in this final segment. Number three, the KPB is not doing us any favors here. The Kenai Peninsula Borough Assembly has now put a resolution out demanding that the governor, that the legislature, that pretty much everybody pay for the schools or else. Uh, It's going to be dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. There's no way we could possibly live on the monies that we had before. Brad, give us the rundown here. Well, like like a lot of other school districts, the the Kenai Peninsula Borough School District is is complaining about not having enough money this, uh, this coming session that it's, or this coming year that it's, that is showing a deficit in its budget. It doesn't know how to cover the budget, and the and the borough assembly uh, responding to that uh, uh, passed a resolution that says uh, assembly members unanimously backed. This is from the Peninsula Clarion. Unan- assembly members unanimously backed and all sponsored a resolution a resolution during the regular meeting on Tuesday, requesting that the state of Alaska make a timely increase to the base student allocation for the states public schools. Uh, and then they went on and added to, they passed a similar resolution last year, but, but recall that governor Dunleavy vetoed, uh, half of the, uh, of the one-time appropriation. And so they specifically called on Gun- governor Dunleavy to, when the legislature passes, uh, the increase to K through 12, the base student allocation that the borough assembly is calling for that for governor Dunleavy to sign it. So they've been, they're 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 now you know extending their plea, uh, their argument, uh, their resolution uh, to both the legislature and to uh, and to the governor to uh, 
to increase funding for base student allocation and, and help. <laughs> you know, the backstory is help get the Kenai Peninsula Borough School District uh, funded at a level that the Kenai Peninsula School School Borough uh, or, or Borough School wants to be wants to be funded. Here's the deal. I, it, they've added to the problem. They aren't adding to the solution. I mean, this is this goes back to a discussion we had last week, and it goes back to the early 20 teens when when people were saying the solution to this problem is to cut spending. The solution to the bu budget problem is to cut spending. And then and then the response was, well, where do you want to cut? And and while some came up with specifics, many didn't. Um, and and so the, the response was, well, you're just being irresponsible. You're saying you're saying to cut without without specifics. And so we don't know where to cut. So we're just going to keep on keep on spending. It's the flip side. What the Kenai Peninsula Borough and and others who are engaged in this sort of uh, fun K through 12, fun the K through 12 industry. What they're engaged in is the flip side of what happened in the early 20 teens, which is fund it. But we're not going to tell you where to, where, where to get the money. You know, it's we got it. We got a two prong problem. One one prong is funding levels, and and you know the Kenai Peninsula Borough conservative, one of the most conservative parts of the state. Kenai Peninsula Borough Assembly says we got a funding problem. Okay, then the second problem is where are you going to get the money? Who pays for this increased funding? It's a two prong problem. They are equal prongs. You you don't solve one without solving the other. You, you, unlike the federal government, you can't create money. So so we've got to get the money from someplace. And when you have a resolution like this that that doesn't that doesn't specify where it comes from, they're not helping solve the problem. They're just increasing. They're just making the problem worse of saying, well, we got to fund it someplace. We got to fund it someplace. And so budgets keep going up and up and up. But deficits keep going up and up and up because they're not coming forward with the with the solution, even if they wanted to say cut the PFD. If that's what they want, they'd, they'd all be voted out, presumably. But even if they want it, even if that's yeah, that's the solution, at least they would have a solution uh, uh, to the to the problem. At least they would have, you know, they would match both prongs. They would come up with, you know, we need increased funding, and here's the source that that we that we say uh, should be used to uh, to to fund it. But they don't do that, and they don't want to do that. They want to be irresponsible. They want to be the heroes. To the to the K through 12 industry by saying yes, we stood up, we said more funding, more funding, but they don't want to take the responsibility of 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 proposing where the funds should come from, and so it's just I mean, you, so we get all these people going around out there and saying more funding, more funding, more funding, more funding. Where's the where's where's it supposed to come from, folks? I mean, give us give us both sides of the both sides of the equation. And if you don't, you're part of the problem. You're not part of you're not part of the solution. Just like, just like back in the early 20 teens, when the when the claim was, when we said cut, and and when the and when the question was, where do you cut? We don't know. You know, it's up to the legislature. Well, that's not. You're not coming up with a solution. You're coming up with just an additional problem. Right. So, well, I, I love. I love how the fact that they that they go on in this the article of the Clarion and they talk about this and they're like, well, you know, they have a deficit and they, you know, they went to the community and the community pushed back over cuts to, you know, pools, school pools and theaters. And, you know, we were able to add all that back on with state one time state money, but we need more to make all that work. You know, I mean, it'd be great to have we can't be all things to all people. And that's the thing. We're not living in a major metropolitan area. We're in a, you know, these are rural districts. Uh, I mean, you know, Kenai, Soldatna, that is a pretty rural area. Those towns are not megapolises. And so you've got to be able to look at it and say, do we really need X or Y? Or are they doing the right thing with the monies that they have right now? I mean, you know, that's the bigger question. And you don't confront that question until you until you answer the question of who pays. I mean, it's it's all about choice, right? Do we do we take money out of this out of out of the private sector to put it into this? And 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 you don't you don't confront whether you're I mean, well, you don't confront whether you're spending it on the right things, whether you're spending enough, whether you're not whether you're spending too much, you don't confront that until you confront the choice, until you until you weigh where you're going to take the money from, what the source is. 
uh, you know, it's like the top 20%. The top 20% keep saying, yeah, spend more, spend more on K through 12, spend more on the university. Yeah, let's have state funded child care. Let's, you know, it, Jesse Sumner, let's, uh, let's, let's build a, uh, you know, let's help, let's use the funds from the state to help build a line down from the slope. And then, and then, you know, they can say that because they propose to do it through PFD cuts because they propose to do it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families where the top 20%, you know, get barely nicked uh, uh, as, uh, as, as those funds, uh, as those funds go by. So they don't, they don't have to make a choice. I mean, they get, it's free money. They just, you know, spend more and more and more of it. It's not coming from our pocket, spend more and more and more of it. And that's, that's the problem when you don't, when you don't answer both sides of the equation, when you don't say spend more here and take the money from here, when you don't answer both sides of the equation, you know, you just, you just get carried away. It's just, yeah, let's do more K through 12 funding. Let's, let's do, you know, we, we need more. We can't, we can't cut here. Where's the money going to come from? It's going to come from your pocket. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Well, it's going to come from my pocket. Then maybe we don't need, you know, extended hours on the pool, or maybe we don't need this if you're going to take it from my pocket. But as long as it's coming from somebody else's pocket, yes, we need all that other stuff. And that's that. That's my complaint about the Kenai. That's it today, that's my complaint about the Kenai Peninsula Borough Assembly, but it's my complaint about everybody who's saying, fund it more and more and more and more. Tell me where the money's from coming from. Tell me what, tell me whose pocket you're taking it from and tell me it's worth it to take it from their pocket and transport, transport it over to these other, these other pockets. Tell me both sides of the equation. And when you don't do that, you just, you know, you're, you're talking into thin air. You're making the problem worse by creating more pressure for spending without addressing the issue of whether that spending is right because of what it's going to cost coming out from the other side. All right, Brad, 60 second recap here down to the end. What, uh, what can we do? Legislature, the, the, the coming legislative session is going to be a mess. Um, uh, and, uh, and we're going to need to stay on top of it. Uh, the last thing we knew need is more government involvement. The last thing we need is the government superseding the private sector in the cook inlet gas supply situation or superseding the private sector, any place we need to build up the fundamental economy, the non-governmental economy. We need to build it up instead of continuing to rate it to, to fund all these government programs. But everybody's asking. Everybody's got their hand out. We need more money. We need more. Where's the money coming from? We don't know. We just want our cut of it and then some and more. That's what it all comes down to. Terry says, at the Valley listening session last night, a few whining about more BSA dollars. Majority with was no more dollars until our children are actually getting an education and school administration is be cut because they are the ones getting all the dollars. I mean, that's the other thing. We keep going back to the BSA. How much of that is actually going into actual education versus administrative and overhead and structural stuff and everything else? I mean, that's the thing. It's a boondoggle. It's a smoke and mirror show because we know that most of that money doesn't make it into the classrooms. So is it really about educating the children or is it about propping up the systems that we have in place that are failing us so far? And Michael, I'm going to go out on a limb here and, 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 and guess that those making the comments about, about your concern about where the BSA money is going is, is because they realize it's coming out of their pockets. Middle income Alaska families realizing that that money's coming out of their pockets and saying, look, we want some accountability before you take this money out of our pockets. We want some accountability. <clears throat> we want some accountability of what's of what's going on here. Top 20 percent, though, I'm going to guess that there weren't a lot in the top 20 percent who were pushing back because they're saying in their minds, they're saying, what do we care? It's not coming out of our pockets. Yeah, it's kind of, it, 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 a trivial amount comes out of our pockets, but look at the benefits we get out of this. Look at the free government benefits uh, we get out of this. So it's and so we're really not paying for it. So what do we care? Yeah, keep building this stuff up. Keep you know keep doing things at the school that will make my Johnny have more have have a have have more programs that he that he can participate in. You know, keep adding on bureaucracy that makes it you know that makes the school have a have a higher reputation someplace when you look at number of uh, academics per uh, per student you know keep keep doing those things that make my johnny uh, uh, better off because the dollars aren't coming out of my pockets the, the significant dollars aren't coming out of my pockets 
the pushbacks coming from people who have to actually see those dollars leaving their pockets. And that's what happens. That pushback happens when you deal with both sides of the equation. When you deal with people who actually have to give up the money and 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 look at what where it's going to be spent. With when we've got you know people like the K through twelve, uh, the K, uh, Kenai Borough Peninsula Assembly rather, uh, when we've got those people and we've got others who are saying, just spend more, spend more, spend more. Um, it's they're not they're not looking at where those dollars have to come from. They're not forced to make the evaluation, the comparison, the trade off between what those dollars are worth in my pocket versus what those dollars are worth when they're when they're spent uh, on K through twelve, and that's. Uh, that's that's the problem we've gotten ourselves into by by using PFD cuts to 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 fund these things because we we don't have everybody with skin in the game. We've only got a portion of the population with significant skin in the game and unfortunately that's not the donor class. Right. Well, and again, since we've seen that there is no real correlation to the continued increase to expenditures for education and educational outcomes, we're not convinced. I mean, many of us are not convinced that that's the answer. Uh, you know, sure, double the money. Does it double the outcome? Does it even increase the outcome by 50%? No. Well, then we've got bigger issues. And I think that's the bottom line. People want to address that. But no, nope, there's a lot of people in government, especially a lot of these politicians at the local level who are just like, I want mine, 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 mine. Give me, give me mine. As long, I don't care where it comes from as long as you give me mine. And, uh, you know, my question is, because a lot of these communities are locked out of being able to fund more, right? They fund up to their own. The state should the state should just reverse that. And I know that there's a whole equity issue of, well, some communities would spend more on education than others. Well, great. You could move to those communities if that's where you want to put your kid. Maybe we should remove the caps. If a local community wants to fund double what they're funding now for education, let them do it. And then people could move with their feet in or out. Yeah, that's a you know that's that's a that's an issue that some states have confronted and decided to do it that way. I, that's a it, we claim the administration claims that our our hands are tied by the federal rule that uh, that's going to these rural districts uh, of how much rural of how much federal aid will come into the rural districts is 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 governed by how much of a dis disparity there is between the highest funded districts and the lowest funded districts, and it can't be more than a can't be more than a certain percent. And the administration says, well, our hands are tied by the federal rule. Other states have done away, have no longer accept those federal funds. They've made the determination that that, that is too tight a restriction to tie around their school systems um, and made the determination that they're not going to take those federal funds and release themselves from the federal rule. That's a debate that's probably worth having in this state. Now, we've got another backup that sits behind that, which is disparity, the constitutional provisions regarding disparity in school districts and, and whether, you know, whether the, the federal rule approximates where we would end up if we, if, if, if that was the, if the second standard is what applied uh, is, is an open question, but it's a debate we ought to have because we do have some school districts that want to keep on spending. We have other right. lo local governments that don't. Yeah, no, and they could do it if they wanted to do it and they wanted to tax their people and the people in those communities were OK with it to increase the school funds and make sure that they get the best of the best. Well, then so be it. Um, I think that that would be the uh, that would that would be the best way to uh, to fix a lot of these problems. You want more money? Tax your people. And if they're happy with it, they'll stick around and uh, they'll continue to do it. Uh, all right, Brad, quickly. Uh, final thoughts. Well, it's a it's a. Long road between here and May when the legislature finally lets out, assuming they'd let out in May this this year. Uh, long road between here and there. We're, we're going to have to stay vigilant. Uh, but, but I go back to the first point. The first point is do not let government get into the middle of, of our energy situation. They will just make it worse. Let the yeah. free market work. Because government has done such a bang up job with everything else. All right, Brad, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming on board. We'll see you next week. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. 
This has been Brad Keith, like Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.